<laughs> I'm back for the long-awaited second installment of my field recording series. You know that because you clicked on it. Today we'll be looking at various miking techniques for omni and cardioid small diaphragm condenser mics as it pertains to stereo ambience recording. I'll also touch on some good habits to establish. If you're not interested in field recording, then this episode will be boring as f But if you are, then hold on to your pantaloons because it's 1,255% nerdy stuff and it's coming right up. So, good day and welcome to the Time Preservation Society. I am once again, Luke Skywalker. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that bell notification so you can be notified the minute new content drops. Cheers. If you haven't yet seen the first installment of my introduction to field recording, you can watch it right here. But if you've already viewed it, then let's begin. In volume one, we discussed what even is a field recording, along with different types of mics and recorders used in the process. For this episode, we will focus on two very popular types of mics for ambience recording, Omni and small diaphragm condenser mics. We'll start with Omni mics. Omni mic configurations. As you likely know, Omni mics are omnidirectional, non-directional. They will pick up sounds equally from all sides, like a, like a sphere. My imagination, sphere. That. As such, they pick up the entire environment. You would not want to use an Omni mic if you're trying to pinpoint a sound in any environment. Omni mics are a top choice for field recorders when recording ambiences due to their open and even recording polar patterns. Omni mics also do not exhibit the proximity effect very much. So the sound shouldn't produce much low end the closer to them you get, but they also don't lose much low end the further you get from them. They're very balanced. This makes them ideal for ambience recording since ambient sounds of all frequencies are coming from every direction. When using Omni mics, the popular miking technique is called AB, basically just a spaced pair, precisely even and parallel with each other. But the key is figuring out how far away to position the two mics from each other. In this example, I've mounted two Clippy mics just over 50 centimeters from each other using the Fell Communications Folding Stereo Microphone Bar. This is from the same company that makes the Clippies, and it's a super handy microphone mounting system. Special thanks to Nick over at Fell Communications for sending me a box of goodies to test out. More of these reviews are imminent but I have so many products and promise videos to get to as well. So, you know, they're, they're spaced, these videos. 50 centimeters apart provides a pretty broad stereo separation while keeping the center also in focus. Generally, the further away the sound source, the further apart your Omni mics can go without losing stereo intelligibility with a center that's prominent. But going too far apart may result in losing the center. So it's very, case dependent. Maybe you want to record a demolition explosion from like a, a kilometer away, but keep that stereo sound. You might go further than 50 centimeters. I always try to keep my Omni mics no closer than 30 centimeters apart from each other to a maximum of about 50 centimeters. I, I'm talking in centimeters here. This is what the world uses to measure metric, right? I'm not measuring it in elephant tails or, you know, goosenecks. Now I'll move the mics closer together and show you the difference. I've adjusted the bar to close the gap and now I'm at 30 centimeters apart. It's always great to experiment with distance. Ideally you want separation between the left and the right but also not lose the center or have too much center. It's about finding the right balance like uh, like deciding that two supersized boxes of cookies are too much to eat in one sitting, so, uh, so you stick with just the one. That's moderation. 
While OmniMics are fabulous at capturing the entire space you're recording in, including the acoustics, this also includes any comb filtering that might be happening as sound waves bounce off hard or shiny surfaces. And this is especially pronounced if summing the stereo recording to mono. So comb filtering is the sound of surfaces that may be too close to the source. For example, if you went up close to a hard and smooth surface, like a wall, and spoke into the wall, like when you're, like when you're talking to your friends and family all about field recording, you'll hear pronounced frequency spikes. So, like, for example, these are acoustic tiles, right? I got them off Amazon. They're very absorbent, and uh, I don't know how good they are, but they definitely help, because listen to what happens when I remove them. So, right now, you can hear the tabletop. Can you hear that? It's a hard and shiny surface. I don't know how shiny it is, but it's hard, and that's what matters, because you can hear the frequencies bouncing off, and what happens is, as I'm talking, a certain frequency is doubled, uh, kind of added, like an additive extra frequency. So somewhere around, I don't know, 700, 1K, something like that. And you can hear that sound of the table. Sounds like I'm talking into a table. Here, here I am talking into a table. But when I put these down, it kind of helps remove a lot of that, that, that sound. So that's comb filtering. If you already knew what comb filtering was, my apologies, I didn't want to come off as condescending. Condescending is when you talk down to somebody and assume that they don't know what you're talking about. So in essence, comb filtering is kind of like the doubling of certain frequencies. Ambience recording is my favorite field recording. I find that the world sounds better through headphones. I love the sound of the world through headphones. Am I nuts? Probably. So that's a quick explanation of the A-B technique for a stereo set of Omni mics. Now, there are a few other techniques for a stereo set of Omni mics, but some of them require more equipment. Some popular techniques that use the Omni mics are the following. Tree ears. This is where the field recordist would attach two Omni mics to each side of a tree trunk. So here's a tree trunk, two sides the trunk acting much like a human head, causing separation between both mics using a dense object between them. Tree ears is often used for drop rigs in a forest or a jungle. A drop rig is a term for setting up an ambience recording and leaving it unattended for periods of time, like overnight. The best way to hear the dawn chorus of birds doing their thing is to leave a drop rig running all night well into the next morning. A dry bag is sometimes employed in drop rigs to, you know, store your recorder in an effort to prevent rain or condensation causing damage to it. And microphones that are less costly to replace are generally used. Clippies are once again a great choice for this method since they are relatively lower cost to replace and there are usually many in stock. A Jekyllin disc is another method of creating separation between the two Omni mics by using a more portable dense material between the mics to act as a sort of head. So that's basically a disc that's made out of, you know, dampening materials such as felt or rubber or carpet and they're used to create this kind of disc that's between the two microphones. Most field recordists find stuff around the house or in hardware stores to make these. Many field recordists use dense but soft yoga bricks between both mics to create a Jekyllin type separation. I once uh, found a couple of yoga bricks at the dollar store, so they're really cheap and useful. Another method that employs a pair of Omni mics is binaural recording, which is just the coolest. Since human ears are specifically designed or evolved with a complex pinna system made up of flaps and folds to instruct the brain as to where a sound is coming from, and with a dense and thick object between them such as my giant and massive head separating both ears, the human brain is audibly immersed in its reality. This is recreated with a binaural mic system. So instead of a disc between two Omni mics, silicone ears are mounted on both sides of a dummy head 
or another dense object. The Omni mics are placed inside the silicone ear canals. The result is a fully immersive human experience recreated with almost eerie accuracy. My favorite affordable binaural mic system is the AWI SR3D systems. I reviewed them a while back and you can watch that right here. These are handmade mics that now employ the world famous Primo EM272 mic capsules as found in the Clippy and Pluggy mics. If you want to purchase the SR3D binaural mic, I've left a link in the description below along with a coupon code to get 10% off your order. Uh, now these mics are usually very, very, very expensive in the thousands. So having one that's much, much uh, lower cost, much, uh, that works great is awesome. So yeah, there you go. And that covers the more popular uses for Omni mics for field recording. Whew, got through it. Moving on to cardioid mics. Cardioid mic configurations. Cardioid mics are also a massive part of field recording, and there are all kinds of ways to employ them. As you may know, regular cardioid mics have a narrow beam when compared to Omnis. They are much more directional and tend to reject sounds coming from outside their beams. When I say reject, I don't mean completely eliminate. I mean that the sound waves hitting the capsules from outside their beams will be lower in volume with considerable high and low frequency roll off. Thinner. It's called off-axis coloration or off-axis attenuation. In case you don't know, attenuation is when sounds are quieter, less energy, less signal. But for the purposes of gathering mono sound effects or for precise stereo ambience recording, they work amazingly well. There is a downside to using cardioid mics, of course, for ambience recording, and that is the further away from your source that you are, the less lows you'll pick up. This is the proximity effect, but in reverse. The closer you get to the mic, the more the low end will be accentuated, and the further you get, the thinner the sound will be. This is not a problem for close miking situations like stereo recording a machine in a factory from three feet away, or the lapping waves at a beach from five feet away, etc. But uh, for stereo ambient recording, there are a few mic configurations or positions or arrays, more than a few. The first and most widely known is the XY configuration. This is a popular mic configuration for recorders that come with built-in mics. They're compact, easy to work with, and is smaller than the other methods. So they can fit usually inside a blimp or other wind protection systems, usually. For long, long mics, doesn't work so well. To recreate your own XY configuration mics, you need to mount them on top of each other and completely perpendicular at each other at 90 degrees, like so. It's important that you're crossing just the tips or the capsules. Finding a mic holder that can mount mics this way isn't as easy or as cheap as you might think. The best one that I know of, maybe I don't know, but this is the one I know of, is the Rode SB20. It's a stereo bar that has all the angle markings for different configurations and also an ability to change one clip height in relation to the other. But make sure that when you're mounting the mics that the XLR ends of your small diaphragm condenser mics are the opposite to the correct sides, right? Because when you have this mic pointed this way and this mic pointed this way, the ends of them will be opposite. So make sure you know which one's which. The mic that faces left will have the butt facing right and vice versa. So be sure to remember which mic is which when you're plugging it in. Left should always go into channel one on your recorder and right goes into channel two. That's how it goes. Don't blow it. Another configuration for a pair of cardioid mics is called ORTF. This is named after the Office de Radio Diffusion Television Francais. I, I don't speak French, but uh, it sounds something like that. If you're French, I'm very sorry if I butchered that. All these acronyms that you're about to hear are named after institutions that described them first. So ORTF is when the capsules are spaced about 17 centimeters from each other and at about 110 degrees. 
This provides a wider stereo image than XY and more similar to human ears. ORTF is a very popular technique for people with a couple of small diaphragm condenser cardioid mics and any stereo mounting bar. You don't need ones that mount over top of each other. You can do it anyway. Then we get into the DIN configuration. DIN stands for, oh man, I'm going to butcher this. Deutsch Institut für Normung. Uh, yeah. And this is where the capsules are about 20 centimeters apart, and the mics are at 90 degrees once again. This allows for an extremely wide stereo field with some noticeable time delay between the mics. This gives that wide sound. And finally, the last popular stereo small diaphragm condenser mic configuration is known as the NOS configuration, named after, oh, this one's going to be even worse, Nederlands Omrope Stitching. I, I, I don't, I'm sorry. I'm, if you're from the Netherlands, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry, everyone. Sorry. NOS, NOS, however you want to say it, is capsules spaced 30 centimeters apart and at 90 degrees again. NOS, NOS, is hard with the Rode SB20 and tiny condensers like the Line Audio CM4 mics. You'd need to use a longer bar for that because you need them to point away, you know what I'm saying, from each other and make sure the capsules are away. This is extremely wide with a large time delay between each channel and an undefined center and can be used for all sorts of fun recordings. Another way to record a very immersive environment with cardioid mics is ambisonics. There are ambisonic mics already made like the Sennheiser Ambio VR or the uh, Rode NTSF1 which each have four outputs and requires a recorder with four inputs to run it, to record with it. Ambisonic mics are all small diaphragm cardioid condensers mounted in a sphere pattern. Um, they're they're subcardioid. So subcardioid means that they're so wide, each cardioid mic is so wide that they're getting getting close to being omnis each, but they're not. And they're all mounted like a like in a sphere pattern. But this information needs to be decoded in post. Many higher-end recorders that can record at least four simultaneous tracks will have an ambisonic setting where the decoding is done inside the recorder. Some people create a makeshift ambisonics array by using four identical cardioid mics, sometimes large diaphragm condenser mics, in an X formation, uh, one, two, three, four, and then they, or a cross, whatever, however you want to look at it, whatever angle you're at. They then note down how they've arranged the mics and where they're facing so that later they can decide where each channel will be placed in the surround audio field. Keeping with you a notepad or a little field notes book and a pencil will be indispensable for you throughout your field recording journey. Speaking of notes, there is a practice that you should practice when field recording with any number of mics. Important practices. When you've set up your mics and recorder, and you've made your notes, just after you press record, you should walk around your mics and audibly announce which side you're on, and include the date, time, location, microphones used or recorder used, wind protection used, levels, bit rate and sample rate, and even orientation like facing east or west, etc. This will give you a failsafe for later when you're editing in post. Sometimes we forget to write down particulars, or maybe we inadvertently plugged mics into the wrong channels, or perhaps we forget which day, which location, which equipment, and even which session it was. It happens a lot. It's happened to me many times. So this is invaluable information that you will thank yourself later for doing. Announcing audibly as much information as you can think of should always begin each recording session. By beginning each recording with side, location, time, date, subject, equipment, and intention identification, you'll be sure that the information is baked right into your recordings for later. Because who knows how long it'll be until you get to work on the recordings and post. By that time, you may have 100 recordings and have completely forgotten 
how or where you set each session up and which direction was which. It happens a lot more than you'd think. Sometimes you go out and record a whole bunch of different stuff and then you'd be like, ah, crap, was that the one by the lake or was that the one by the stream? Was that, was that the market that I was at or was that the hockey? I don't even... Even when recording mono sounds, always announce that same info, especially what you're recording right at the beginning of the recording. It's easy to find and identify, and it's a fail-safe for later. For example, if I was recording a stereo ambience of a suburban neighborhood, I would announce suburban ambience, January 8th, 2024, 4 p.m., Candy Cane Lane, North Pole, Canada, facing southeast in front of Hermes House. Two Clippy EM272 mics in AB formation at 50 centimeters apart into a Sound Devices Mix Pre 62 at 32 bits and 48 kilohertz wave audio. Gain is set at 5. No roll-offs or special settings. Win protection is two Rycote Baby Ball gags with dead cats. This is the left side. This is the right side. Or if I was recording, let's say, mono sound effects, this is how I'd do it. Fart recording number 23, January 3rd, 2024, at 3.13 a.m., my studio. Sennheiser 416 into a Sound Devices Mix Pre 32 with gain at 4 at 24 bits, 48 kilohertz. No roll-offs or special settings. Bush's Baked Beans. It's the audio version of slating each shot of a movie with a clapperboard with scene and take information at the beginning of each shot when filming a movie. Uh, and don't skimp on the information. Clearly state the exact recorder and exact mics. You never know how many years and how many pieces of gear later you'll be revisiting these recordings. Was like was that the Zoom H5 or was that the H1N or was it the F3? I can't remember when I got the new recorders. I wish I didn't just say Zoom. You know what I'm saying? Because if you end up releasing your sounds, having the correct recording information will be crucial to selling it. So it's easy to fall into the habit of just getting the recording done and skipping all this, but you will be so happy that you did that later, especially a lot later. A side benefit of always doing this is that it forces you to check all these things in case you inadvertently made an error. Like, if you're after low-end rumble and you've got the high pass turned on or you accidentally have the left side plugged into the right side, etc. Another practice to always practice is having your headphones with you and using them. You need to hear what you're doing, at least while setting up. Make sure that there are no problems that can be easily rectified. There's nothing worse than checking your recording later only to find that the right side wasn't recorded because the XLR wasn't plugged in all the way. Or if you have wind issues you didn't know about or your levels were too hot. E even sometimes when you're looking visually, you miss things. It misses things that you can hear with your ears. So take the time to do it right the first time. Once this becomes a habit, it'll be a habit. And uh, that'll just about do it for me and volume two of my introduction to field recording series that I finally got to. So sorry about the delay. My apologies for it going so long, though. There's so much to cover with field recording. Uh, so be on the lookout for volume three in my introduction to field recording series. We'll get into all sorts of stuff like stands, wind protection, how to build your kits, and lots more stuff and lots more out in the field. These are all preliminary theory, theory, talky, 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 talky videos. So you get all the theory first. We'll get out there and do more as we learn. You'll find I'm full of surprises. Bye now. In transmission. And uh, please watch these videos. These. These ones. Watch them. Because they're good. They're good for you. They're good for your health and for me. So watch them.